talking about Social Security and retirement decisions. And we are going with a panel format today. So we are going to give you a real breadth of knowledge and perspectives on this topic. So I just want to take a few minutes, introduce the members of our panel, give you a few ground rules for the discussion that's going to follow, um, and then you know, get things started. So uh, first up today is going to be Jason Fitchner. And he's a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. But he, in a previous life, was a deputy commissioner of Social Security and has taken on a lot of different policy roles. And that's going to be something informing uh, his talk today. And he has been kind enough to give us the overview piece of the panel. So he's going to kind of set up the topic, let us know um, about some research that has been done and some of the policy concerns that go along with this. So he will be our first panelist, and then following him will be Lisa Schneider, and she is a research director at the Matthew Greenwald and Associates in DC. And Lisa has really a wide-ranging expertise in survey research, so on, on a lot of different topics, but what she's gonna be talking about today is research that she did with colleagues about how, pe how much people know, or as it turns out, don't know about Social Security. And I think what's really interesting here is she talked to both households and financial advisors, and so we're gonna get kind of different perspectives on where the gaps in knowledge are and how those might be important. And then our last panelist, Melissa Knoll, who is a social science research analyst with SSA. She is going to, we keep getting more and more detailed as we go through the panel, and she's gonna be telling us about a really interesting experiment that she and colleagues did and trying to understand how a decision is presented to individuals, how that reflects, or how that impacts their retirement decisions, and in particular, the decision to claim early benefits or wait until normal retirement age. So hopefully, by the time we're done with this, you'll kind of have a lot of different perspectives on this question um, about knowledge and framing and how that relates to Social Security. Uh, and thank you to George Washington University and the Federal Reserve Board for speaking series. Uh, I think these events are very important to highlight various aspects of research on financial and how it impacts uh, very important contemporary public policy issues. Uh, with that, the standard disclaimer applies. Um, the opinions I say here are mine and mine alone, do not represent the Mercatus Center, George Mason, George Washington, Georgetown, Virginia Tech, Johns Hopkins, <laughs> any person living or dead, past, present, or future. I there I'm, uh, I'm going to about issues on framing, and I'm going to frame the rest of the panel's discussion, so pun intended, framing a secure retirement and why it matters today. In fact, why it matters today, I think, more than ever. With that, um, age, recent economic of course, have vastly changed the retirement landscape. That might be an understatement, but let's start with that. Um, declines in assets as well as high unemployment change the retirement plans of many Americans. Those who plan to retire early are not working longer. Those who want to work and lost can't actually continue working. Um, shock and wealth have likely influenced retirement behavior. Um, why now more than ever for secure retirement? Of course, the stock market is one issue, and I'll show you why. Interest rates, the labor market, retirement plans, these frames are just popping up. Annuity, so framing matters. The S&P 500, this is the stock market. Uh, one of the things, of course, we talk about retirement, for those who do retirement planning or talk to people about savings, we always mention the idea of doing a diversified portfolio. Now, I just picked the S&P 500 as one example of a diversified stock portfolio. But of course, if you were somebody who was looking at 1970 to 2000, this is a great way to have a diversified portfolio to save for your retirement. Until, of course, you get to the income shocks and the wealth shocks that happen because of recessions. So we've told folks to save, 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 but the stock market's not been helping them out lately. Of course, it's coming back up. Now the question is, what happens when we get to another peak? Will it maintain? Will it go down? Have we gotten to a point where stability is gone in the market, and all we're dealing with is constant cycles of peaks and valleys? Yield on 10-year treasuries. What happens when you retire? What do they tell you to do with your stock assets? Put them in bonds. Bonds are safe. They'll pay out just a nice return. Don't have to worry about it. Well. Unfortunately, kind of with some easy monetary policies going on, other factors in the global economy, we are hurting savers. Savings <coughs> rates for interest are very low at their all-time low in some ways. Um, this, of course, can't last forever. 
we can't get too much further down. What do retirees do today? Do they put it in bonds, knowing that interest rates may go up and they could lose some of their assets in the bond value? Do they go in the stock market, knowing that the market may crash again? What do you do? It creates some instability and insecurity. The average uh, annual rate in 30-year mortgage has also got gone down. It's a good time to be a borrower. If someone wants to borrow money, maybe take out a home equity loan, it's a good time. But is that the right thing to do for retirement security? You hear a lot of people telling retirees now to take money out of their house. That that is a, of course, a form of asset and wealth they use retirement. But do we want to encourage people to borrow just because the interest rates are low? All these things go into the idea of right now, I think, is a really insecure time for people who are either retired or looking at retirement. Labor markets. Um, this is the official rate for unemployment. You guys have all heard about the 8.1% unemployment rate, 12.5 uh, million people unemployed. This is the official number. Right? So it includes um, basically those who are looking for work in the last four weeks. <coughs> Active looking does not encourage, does not include discourage workers, students, uh, those who've left the labor force because they're just tired. What happens we start including those is a different measure. It's called the unemployment <coughs> ratio. Um, this looks at what happens if you include all those who are 16 and older who are eligible to work. Uh, they might have gone back to school, they might be working part-time, but what do you have if you include them? You'll now see the job market, the labor market looks a lot worse. In fact, from a recessionary standpoint, we still have not yet recovered. This is the labor market that's facing today's college graduates, as well as those who are looking at retiring today, uh, what that means going forward for work retirement. This gets into the bottom line. Um, the recession has had an impact not just on, of course, employment, but financial net worth has been down about 5.5 trillion, homeowner equity 8 trillion, government net worth 5.8 trillion, this is from uh, the flow of funds data the Federal Reserve, uh, it's given wealth impact. We also have what's called a national income impact. This is from the Congressional Budget Office. It basically looks at what the economy could be, potential GDP and what would have been declined because of the recession. You add it all up, we've lost about $23 trillion in some way of wealth. It's 150% of GDP. This is kind of the framework of what's going into people's minds today when they're thinking about retiring, the stability of retiring, do they leave their job, do they go back to school, do we have job lock? Are people afraid to leave their job because of health care or the instability of the employment market? These are things that are keeping the economy right now from reaching a full potential of growth. So with that, um, goodbye BB, hello DC. This is private pension plans. The data comes from the uh, Department of Labor and there was a source putting up there with a link to the data. But you'll sort of see from the private sector, total pursuits of DB has been kind of flat, but defined contribution plans are going up. This kind of leads to a question of wondering, are we as individuals on our own when it comes to retirement? Um, our fathers, our grandparents were sort of used in some ways to having a secure cash flow coming in. So a security, a DB plan, maybe a secure retirement. Now you've got a DC plan. How do you do the decumulation phase? Where does it go? Do you put it into annuities? Do you do a lump sum? People are confused. They don't know where to turn. There's a lot of issues that come in for financial literacy here, of course, also framing. Where I come in also is the reliance on Social Security. Uh, as you'll see here, this is copy and paste from the facts and figures. Uh, right now, all beneficiary units, 65% rely on Social Security for 50% or more of their income in retirement. 38% rely on 90% or more. A lot more people are relying on Social Security for the safe, secure, dignified retirement. Uh, this leads into the important question of when do you start receiving retirement benefits? Because that monthly benefit amount needs to last so much longer as people are living longer. And that's an issue we'll discuss as well. One of the things we changed at Social Security when I was there was we moved this chart and this picture. And it's amazing how a picture does say a thousand words when looking at a thousand dollars. People were trying to figure out when to claim benefits. And the agency was doing something about saying the break even, come in, take it at 62, you'll be ahead for 14 years. You'll get a month, lower monthly payment, but you get it for a longer period of time. You'll be ahead for 14 years. That was the language. We start showing a picture and saying, if you're forward coming to $1,000, you come at age 62, you'll get 750 a month. That's 25% less. If you wait till 70, look at the gain you'll get. 1320, it's a 32% increase. Showing the gain versus the loss changed behavior at Social Security, not just from the recipients and the beneficiaries who were coming in to claim benefits, but also changed the culture of the employees we had at Social Security, who thought one way the break even was the way to go, and now see this and thought, what information have we been giving people just based on framing alone? So just showing a picture in some way can change behavior. This is some research I've done with Barbara Smith and John Phillips. Um, 
we're basing this off of uh, clearing data of the Social Security Administration. This is just out of the annual statistical supplement. What you'll see is the OSID, this is retirement benefits awarded, percent at age 62 from 1985 going forward. You'll see there was trending down for a while, picked up, and then definitely picked up again after the financial recession. Um, this led us to look at a question. What was happening in the retirement landscape? Were people looking at the financial crash and saying, oh my gosh, um, my 401k is now a 201k, uh, I need to continue working longer, I can't take benefits early, or are they losing their jobs, not finding new employment, saying now I'm forced to take retirement benefits early. Um, we were finding if you net both those out, there's a little bit of an increase in those paying benefits at 62. And as we talked about earlier, because the lower benefit amount happens at age 62, these people are getting a lower benefit amount for the rest of their life. What does that mean for a secure retirement? So the research I've done with Barbara Smith and John Phillips sort of broke it out, looked at gender, saw that again for both male and females, percentage of age 62 claim was going up, looked at it by race, um, saw that for whites it was a little flat, but for um, blacks it was going up a little bit. So this is still important, we're seeing this morning how this trends to continue. We're gonna update our research um, going forward. Barbara's starting to run the numbers now. But this is the important part. If we're looking at a, a new cohort that's taking benefits earlier, 62, more so than usual, what does that mean 10 years out from now? Uh, or 15 years out from now, when those individuals have a lower monthly benefit amount than they would have had, also have lower assets in 401ks. How is that going to result in uh, security and financial stability? And what's it going to mean for public policy when they come looking for more government assistance if that's possible? This then leads into some framing questions about how we actually present data to people and information so they make an informed decision. So this also leads to a question of the annuity puzzle. We've all heard this before. People with 401ks, a lot of them take a lump sum. Uh, why don't they annuitize? Why don't they take a secured, guaranteed stream of income payments over the course of their life? Why are people taking benefits age 62, even though it's a lower benefit amount? And they could delay claiming, get a higher benefit amount later on. These are questions that puzzle economists, and there's always answers, maybe say maybe the cost or fees are too high, time value of money preferences, um, but at least the interesting things. Why don't people, more people buy annuities? Um, survey recently done by Cogent Research um, asked them, is guaranteed income an important consideration in your retirement? And they all basically said it was. Um, said it was. Annuities are a critical part of retirement strategy. For those who are annuity owners, 70% said it's an important component. For those who weren't, 70% said it was. Right? So the difference in education, how you inform people. 29% um, of people said the public media had a negative impact on annuities. The impression the public was getting from media reports of annuities was changing their behavior and changing how they felt about annuities and their impression. Of non-annuity owners, only 5% know this very extremely knowledgeable about annuities. They weren't getting education. For those who are looking at selling annuity products, this led to an information and idea that maybe they need to do a better job of framing and informing the public about the benefits of annuities. The need for more information and education. On the education side, um, even we put out reports is 44% of baby boomers and Gen X won't have adequate retirement income. And again, setting the stage, this concerns me. What happens when most people actually get retired and don't have the right amount of income to live a dignified and secure retirement? 70% of people over age 65 have health, health issues that could necessitate long-term care. Long-term care is very costly. That could get into retirement savings very quickly if they have them. Or one out of every four 65-year-olds will live past 90. One out of 10 will live past 95. That's SSA data that's in that pamphlet we have now. But we're also showing, of course, as longevity is increasing. We're living longer. I would go around in field offices and ask people about their claiming age and say, you know, how old are you? Do they say 62 or 63? That's great. And uh, I'd say, how long have you had a living? I'd say, I've had a living to 85 or 90. I'd say, great, so you have enough retirement income to last you 25 years. They said, no, I have enough income to last. And they would also realize, it's not saying 85 to 90 is an age, there's over 20 years of retirement. They just hadn't done that kind of math, even though it's so simple. They just figured it would always be that. But you say you're not working for their 20 years, and all of a sudden that framing decision changed their decision about maybe I shouldn't be in this office today. Maybe I should go back and reconsider when I claim benefits. I don't have enough money for 20 years. It's amazing to think about time of death as an age versus duration you are in unemployment and in retirement, how that changed also the decision making process. Uh, FINRA asked a question on their studies, true or false, buying a single company stock usually provides a safer return than a stock mutual fund. Only 53% got it right, and whopping 40 said we don't know. 
Again, the lack of education out there is just amazing. Obviously, studies by Olivia Mitchell and Henry Lasardi, there's so many I couldn't fit them on a PowerPoint, um, showing you a basic lack of financial understanding. Um, there's a question the other day whether we should do financial literacy. It doesn't matter. Um, when you talk to those in public policy education about the two areas they want to spend more money on, it's math and science. What is financial literacy? It's definitely math. Maybe a little bit of science in there. Uh, people who can't do basic math have a hard time doing basic financial literacy. They're very highly coordinated. Um, this is a way to get people educated why financial literacy is so important. Why framing matters? Um, again, how you present information changes the perspective. It's like saying it's something half full versus half empty. You've always heard your parents say you look at the gloomy side as opposed to the positive side. That's a framing issue. Framing makes a big difference on how we view things. Uh, again, the examples that break even analysis. Um, Jeff Brown, Ari Kepten, and Olivia Mitchell just had a report last year's study that looked at Social Security's original break even language and how we've changed the language and sort of did four or five different framing effects and found that changing the framing changed the person's decision on when to claim benefits by well over a year and sometimes up to 16 months just by changing the framing. What that says for those who are economists is that maybe the, the, the economic decision does not appear to be rational and it can be influenced very easily. For public policymakers, this just shows the importance of what information is being presented to the public can change the very behavior you're interested in supporting. Whether it's the Social Security Administration, SEC, um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, our Education Department of Labor, all these government agencies put out educational information, pamphlets, briefings, online materials. We always want to make sure it's transparent, it's accurate, and it's clear. We're not always thinking about the narration and the framing that comes along with that narration, and is that changing the behavior of some indicator you're trying to actually affect? We need to start doing more research on the framing issues. Uh, annuities. Um, interesting, I love talking about annuities. It's good looking and say it's not a good investment. I look at and I retire. Why should I take a 401k as a lump sum versus an annuity? The lump sum, I have all that money today. I can take that lump sum, put it in bond fund X, mutual fund Y, and make 6%. What do I get for annuity? Oh, it's like 2% or something. It's not worth it. It's a bad investment. People don't like it. What happens if you change the framing and say, don't look at it as an investment. Look at it as consumption. Would you like to guarantee that you have a certain number of dollars per month to spend for the rest of your life? You'll say, oh, yeah. Income spending is very important to me. I would love to have that. What if I could guarantee you X dollars in premium consumption? More people choose to have annuities. Um, so research shows that when you do view annuities as consumption, and smooth and guaranteed spending. They view it as an insurance. Um, when viewed as an investment, it's risk and return. This is again another study by Jeff Brown. Jeff Brown is quickly becoming one of my favorites with Anna and Olivia on behavioral studies and financial literacy because the importance of how he shows framing changes the decisions. Just changing in the nature of how someone views an annuity based on consumption as opposed to investment changes behavior. When you changed it, 72% chose an annuity versus 21% under investment in the framework analysis they did. That's a big change. Without doing anything else to a product, just having them view it as consumption or investment, change the, change the take up rate dramatically. That's how framing is important. Um, there's another study by Turner that was interesting. He was looking at, again, annuities, why they don't take them. He just did a, an online survey of all these retirement planners that are online. Uh, and there's a bunch of them. SSA has one, ARP has one. And they ask you basic questions about your preferences, try to get an interest, are you more risk averse or not? He said very few of them, if any, asked them if they ever thought about an annuity. Just not ask the question. So you did research and started asking the question. Just asking the question makes people think about the availability of the product. So one of the things is we're not even asking the question about annuities. Um, with that, I'll stop. I think I'm near my time. And we'll turn over to Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anna, GW, and uh, Federal sure. Reserve Board for having us here. Um, one of the things that I wanted to start off doing was just taking a minute to explain how Greenwald & Associates, a full-service market research company, came into this topic um, and how I personally came into this topic. Uh, and much to my dismay, it's not because I'm retiring anytime soon. This is really what started it all. And some of you may be familiar with this slide. It's been floating around for about 22 years. Um, it comes from the Retirement Confidence Survey that's done every year by Greenwald and & Associates and Ebre, um, and it's a question that they've trended uh, among workers uh, for the entire duration of this study. Um, 
when I first saw this slide, I was shocked. <laughs> um, Two thirds uh, of the American public has relatively little faith that they'll receive retirement benefits equal to what retirees are receiving today. Um, and to me, it begs the question, why? Um, was it founded on real knowledge? Um, was it hype? Was it, um, you know, unfounded concern? And um, in 2008, I got another chance to sort of re-ask this question with a slightly different audience. Um, it was just pre-crisis 2007 data collection, so this study came at the right time. Um, and this study was with Gen Xers and Gen Yers, and one of the things that we found both in RCS and saw again here is that that confidence in receiving Social Security benefits is even lower among younger consumers. Um, our study uh, found very similar things, and here's a, a slightly different scale, similar question um, from the research that I'm going to talk about today, which we did for the Financial Literacy Research Consortium. Um, that there's pretty low uh, confidence um, in receiving benefits. And uh, just to be exact, it is uh, on that confidence scale just 19% uh, who said not at all confident uh, in our last survey, but among Gen Xers and Gen Yers, it was 28%. So it was much higher. Uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but when you say of equal value, is that of holding? Uh, we, we didn't ask about inflation. Well, we did ask about inflation, but not in this particular question. So equal value means nominally equal? It's, it's up to the interpretation of the respondent. The, the way we've come to understand it over the years is that people um, assume the same purchasing power as today. Um, so this is just a little bit on people's views, but this is not why we're here today. Why we're here today is because of the research we did somewhat as a result. And I need to also thank Matt Greenwald, president of Greenwald & Associates, Ari Captain of RAND, Olivia Mitchell, um, Andrew Biggs at uh, American Enterprise Institute, um, all for contributing to different phases of this research at different stages. The main thing I'm gonna talk about today is a survey we did of 2,000 Americans. Um, we did a phone survey in uh, 2010, and we asked people to uh, describe how they felt about their knowledge of Social Security, but then we also sort of administered a seven-question quiz to, to see how they really scored and how they really fared. The other thing we did, which I'll just talk a little bit about um, today, was some research with financial advisors from a variety of distribution channels, including wirehouses, regional broker dealers, bank reps, life agents, and independents. We're all in that mix. Um, and we asked them what they know and um, the extent to which they're engaging with their clients um, in conversations about Social Security and really specifically, um, and to what Jason was talking about, about when to claim. Our advisors are actually talking to their clients about when to claim. So here's what we found. What do people know? Well, one thing we know is that they're not prepared for retirement, and they know it too. Um, just 10% would give their retirement readiness a, a score of an A, a grade of an A. 23% um, um, would say they're failing. And self-assessed scores tend to be overly optimistic, so you can only assume <laughs> the reality is far lower. Um, we asked people how knowledgeable they feel about Social Security. Um, most of them fall in that somewhat knowledgeable category. At least they think they do. And um, very few say not at all knowledgeable. We asked them specifically about aspects of the system, how knowledgeable they felt <coughs> about these things. Um, most felt they know when they're eligible. 29% second there, uh, though still disturbingly low, 29% understood the idea that their benefits would change based on when they claim. 32% felt very knowledgeable about what their benefit would be. Some felt uh, knowledgeable about how working after claiming would affect their benefits. I think the most important thing on, on this slide is the 30% the who understood that their benefits would change by when they 
chose to claim. And, and equally important, I found this very interesting, how few people understood the interaction between when they claim and its impact on their spouse. Just two in 10, roughly, understanding the, the impact that their claiming decision will have on their spouse and even what their spouse is entitled to. Yeah. Do, do you have any sense of whether they have the right understanding? Yes. Okay. So to come. Okay. <laughs> This is how they felt, right. Here we actually quizzed them. So they had chosen, it was a seven question uh, quiz that was administered through the survey. Um, these were asked on different scales here. I just have shown correct and incorrect responses. Um, certainly six and 10, a large portion understand that um, their benefit will be taxed if they work. We've got a large proportion who understand the fact that their benefits will be adjusted for inflation. Um, I could argue that one because I think some of them don't understand what inflation is in the first place, um, but they understood the concept um, when we tested it. Um, six and 10 understood that um, benefits will change by when you claim. They will not, how in the reverse here, they will not stay the same no matter when you claim. Um, very few people understood how social security benefits are calculated. We showed them a variety of formulas and asked them to identify the right one. Um, if this to me might not be something we need or expect a general beneficiary to understand. The others, however, have an impact on what they will get. Here again, uh, the remainder of the quiz, um, if people are not eligible for social security, Security, um, they could still receive it if their spouse qualifies. So they understand the spouse's eligibility, but little else about spousal benefits. 75% um, did understand that uh, stoppage of work and claiming do not have to be one and the same. However, most of them plan to do just that. Last year, 88% understood that there is a disability benefit provided by Social Security. Here we cut some of the data by age and uh, income to understand what the differences were. This was the lowest of, of all the quiz scores, understanding how benefits were calculated. Um, and it's pretty uniformly low. Uh, we're not seeing a huge age effect. We're not seeing a huge income effect. What we do see um, an income effect is an understanding of that the age at which you claim will change the amount you receive. And um, those in the higher income categories are more likely to answer this correctly. That also skewed with education. And here's the, uh, the inflation question. Understanding that benefits will be adjusted for inflation. Um, does increase with age except in the lowest income bracket? Or at least the lowest we examined here. So here they hold consistent in that under 35K category whereas otherwise knowledge of inflation adjustment increases uh, with age. So here I kind of just real simple put the two together. This is how they really did. 4% got an A, 50% a D or an F when we scored them. And then here are the numbers from that self-assessed. And the real concerning thing is the 7% at the end versus the 50% getting a D or an F. Um, you know, these are people who were blatantly overestimating their knowledge and their understanding. And it's hard to believe it's not impacting their decisions. And hard to believe it's in any sort of positive way. Um, one of the things the survey also explored was who Americans trust to educate them. They don't know, then who's going to educate them? Um, and this is where we found one of what I think is the most interesting contradiction in the survey. That despite all these concerns about solvency, I'm not going to get my benefit. I don't know how it works. The number one source of information that they trust, the brand of the Social Security Administration is so strong that that's still who they trust to provide them with information not just on how Social Security works, but on retirement planning in general. And the second group, um, though if you look at the green bar alone, far lower, financial advisors, nonprofit organizations, banks and investment companies, and media, 
um, fall far to the edge. But there are two groups here that I want to continue talking about, what the Social Security Administration can do, and then also a little bit about the financial advisors. Just a quick question. Did you check with any other agencies besides SSA? Because labor also gives them a lot of information. I was wondering, EBSA puts out a lot. So I was just wondering if you, if you check the EBSA stuff. Reliability I'm going to double check for you. I don't think we named any other agency. I do believe there was an option for other government agency and didn't make the top, the top few. So here you see um, the darker green bar interest and importance of Social Security Administration educating on how Social Security works. 89% um, we don't see numbers that high in consumer surveys very often. 89% say it's very important, um, followed very closely by 83% who feel the Social Security Administration should at least be playing a role in helping people prepare financially for retirement in general. One of the things we asked was what could Social Security be doing? What could they be providing? Um, estimates for how much people will receive from Social Security if they claim at different ages. It turns out, folks, that Social Security does this. Um, it doesn't mean, however, that Americans know they do this, know how to find it, or find it user-friendly. Um, that has yet to be tested, or perhaps others have tested it. Um, but they do this um, already, and a large percentage say this is gonna be an extremely valuable tool for them as they look for retirement information. Um, information to help you figure out the best age to claim your Social Security benefits is a little bit trickier. Americans want advice. That is hard for the Social Security Administration to implement. However, it's not hard for all of those trusted sources to implement. Some of them can provide advice, namely financial advisors, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, a large number of people want information on the health of the Social Security system. They want it from Social Security. Another thing that is difficult to provide, um, but still, um, I think, valuable, because I think some of the qualitative research that we've done, just as an aside, um, when we talk to people about claiming Social Security, we hear very fear-driven responses. I will claim at 62 because I want to lock it in. I want to make sure it's there. Um, they, so some qualitative evidence to suggest that solvency concerns may be driving poor claiming decisions. Other things we found, calculators and worksheets to show people how much to save for retirement. Um, information on disability benefits, and again, calculators and worksheets to help people decide how much they can spend once they retire. I mean, these are basic budgeting and accumulation worksheets and calculators uh, that people are asking for. Um, far, far little less interest, I suppose, in just receiving a list of reputable organizations. Again, something we've heard in, in qualitative research, people don't want to be redirected. They just don't want to get pushed off to someone else. Um, this is the, the brand, the source that they trust. I want to talk a little bit about advisors because they trust advisors as well. Um, and in a recent study, uh, we found that about four in ten households in America have some type of financial advisor, someone, some type of financial professional that they go to routinely for financial advice. Um, and what we found is that with advisors. <coughs> They really have an influence. They have an influence on when the conversation first takes place. So if an advisor brings up the idea of claiming it happens at age 55, if they sit back and they wait for their clients to mention it's at age 60, and arguably it's way too late. Um, because if someone, you, you're not catching them soon enough to make any meaningful changes that would allow them to delay claiming. Um, this I found wonderful and refreshing. Um, 75% of advisors are actually engaging their clients in these conversations in the first place. It's not about what's in it for them. They see it as part of holistic retirement planning. Nine and 10 um, have broader conversations about the role of Social Security. Seven and 10 said they were providing specific advice on when to claim. 
they feel their clients are generally claiming too early, though interestingly, they're only about a year apart from their clients. So uh, the majority of advisors said that they would advise clients claim at age 66. What they really think is happening is that their clients are claiming at 65. Um, but they do, there's an acknowledgement at least by four and 10 that some clients are claiming too early. Framing. Um, advisors, despite all their best intentions, might actually be doing a disservice to their clients in the way that they're framing the claiming decision to them. In a lot of ways, I think it's fair to say they're using pretty outdated language to frame the conversation. Um, Social Security moved away from this, but it hasn't trickled down to the way the advisors are doing this. Um, a, a large share of advisors still consider the break-even analysis a, a viable way of advising clients on when to claim. And um, many, I, I forget the exact percentage that they're actually doing it in addition to just assessing it as a good tool. We asked them to pick from three possible frames um, in terms of how they're usually presenting the decision to claim to their clients. One was in terms of saving one was in terms of an insurance value, and one was as a gamble. Um, many say it's saving, four in 10, that's probably fairly harmless. The, the four in 10, however, who are telling their clients that Social Security is a gamble, um, are probably dissuading them from delaying claiming, um, and therefore denying their clients uh, an inflation-adjusted annuity. Lisa, I'm sorry, yeah. that, that's financial advisors' opinion, I believe. Yes. Yeah, this is financial advisors. We also asked advisors how they felt Social Security Administration was doing in educating them as an audience, train the trainer. And they do give Social Security relatively um, low marks in this area. And um, one of the things we found, for example, was that just 32% of advisors were aware that Social Security had a web page for advisors. Um, it, it exists, it's good, I've seen it. <laughs> um, but only 32% of them were aware of it. Um, imagine what would happen if we could increase awareness of that site and tell them to stop using the break-even analysis. So just some concluding comments. Um, that this lack of knowledge about Social Security matters, not because we need everybody to be an expert in how to calculate benefits, um, but because it's likely contributing to concern about the health of the system, that concern about the health of the system is likely contribu contributing to some bad claiming decisions, decisions that are not allowing people to maximize their Social Security benefit. Um, one of the things that seems really clear from this research is that to the extent possible, um, looking at Social Security from a consolidated household approach rather than an individual approach might be really beneficial for, for households. And that the failure to understand how a spouse's benefit affects you um, means that they're not getting the maximum benefit that they could as a household. Um, which, side note, probably disproportionately impacts women's long-term financial security and retirement. Um, Americans clearly trust the Social Security Administration despite all of the solvency concerns that we've seen. Um, and not just to educate on their benefits, but on retirement in general. We heard words like clearinghouse of retirement information. And while that might be really tricky to do. They want advice that, that perhaps Social Security cannot provide to them. Um, there should be ways to leverage the people who can provide uh, more personalized advice. And the advisors who are also highly trusted um, can provide some of that and they are willing to do so, which I found very, very optimistic and refreshing. And um, at the same time, a, a little dismayed because some of them are probably using suboptimal framing techniques and might be leading their clients to make poor decisions. That was some of what we found in this research. It was probably three studies altogether and um, a lot of work, but thank you.
PW and the Federal Reserve Board for inviting me here today to speak on this panel. Um, I'm very excited to present this research to you. Some of you may have seen it already at a previous conference, but I'm still excited to present it to you again. Um, this is work I've been doing over the past about year and a half with some colleagues at um, the Center for Decision Sciences at Columbia University. And it's something I'm going to present to you is query theory. And you may or may not have heard of this already. Um, it's a process model of decision making that's been used to explain a lot of different consumer decisions. But the reason this research is particularly exciting for me is that it's the first application of applying query theory to a policy relevant decision or uh, something on this nature, specifically this question is the retirement decision. So um, before I begin, just have to state that the opinions expressed are mine and don't represent, and the authors, and don't represent the views of the Social Security Administration. The Social Security Administration is neutral with regard to when people claim their retirement benefits, so we're not in the business of giving advice. We don't care if people claim benefits early or late. We're completely neutral in that regard. So we understand it's a personal decision and that everyone has to take into account their own personal situation. Nevertheless, we do see that 40 to 50% of Americans claim benefits as soon as they're eligible. And Jason showed a graph on this. This can tends to go up and down depending on certain economic factors or other situations. Um, and then Lisa showed us that, I think Jason too, uh, many Americans are financially underprepared for a long retirement, sometimes lasting about 20 years. Um, so coupled with the fact that Social Security retirement benefits are a primary source of income for a large portion of older Americans, becomes clearly very important why it matters when people claim their retirement benefits. So again, Jason went over this. Um, benefits can be claimed anytime after age uh, 62, and the longer claim is delayed, the larger the monthly benefit. So if we think of it um, in terms of an intertemporal choice, or a choice that somebody is making now that's going to affect them in the future, um, we can see claiming, retirement claiming, as a choice between a, sooner a smaller benefit sooner so a lower benefit, let's say at age 62, or a larger benefit later. So we were interested in how people make this decision from basically a psychological perspective. So the theory I'm going to introduce here to explain, help us explain this decision is called query theory. It was first introduced in 2007 by Eric Johnson and some of his colleagues. Um, and it's a memory-based model of preference construction, so that it, it rests on the notion that people don't just have stored memories for many of their preferences and many of the, the, the decisions they're going to make, but rather people construct their preferences on the fly or on the spot. And in order to do this, according to query theory, people construct these preferences by asking themselves about the pros and cons of the decision at hand. Um, very important for query theory is the notion that decisions often have a reference point or a default or the status quo is what people first start thinking about when they're trying to make their decisions. And initial thoughts are biased in favor of this reference point or the starting point. And you'll see this later as I start going through the study. The study is five studies. Um, and initial thoughts are biased in favor of this, and this also then proceeds to allow the subsequent thoughts to be influenced by this bias as well, and not they're suppressed. So just in, in terms of memory, when you think about one thing, you suppress the later thing. Um, and the reference point predicts the order and balance of thoughts, which then predicts choice. So this last one is really the primary query theory aspect of it, which is the reference point predicts what you're going to think about and when you're going to think about it, and this then can predict choice. So um, query theory has actually been used for a number of, to explain a number of different consumer decisions. One example is the endowment effect, which is basically the finding that people think something they have is worth more than somebody who's trying to buy it thinks it's worth. We see this a lot with the housing market, for example. Everyone thinks their house is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars more than people are willing to pay for it. And um, there have been a lot of, basically loss aversion has been the reason people uh, give for this. But query theory has also been used to explain it. And the reason there is that for the seller, for example, um, the natural reference point or the status quo is I have my house and I want to sell it. For, this, for the buyer, the status quo is I have this money and I want to buy the house. So that type of different reference point for each the seller and the buyer affects the thoughts they're going to have. For the seller, it's, I have this house, and you're bringing up all these points out why it's good. Why should somebody get you to sell it? If you're the buyer, you have this money. What's so good about this house that I should spend my money? So you can see from there that whatever the reference point is or the status quo or the default of the question can really influence the way you think about the question, how you ask yourself these pros and cons about the decision, things like that. So if you bring this into the retirement context, 
the reason we actually went about this study in the first place was I thought maybe, I kind of, I, I'm a psychologist by training, so I come into the retirement decision thinking about why do people do what they do. So we know people claim benefits early, so why do they claim benefits early? Maybe it's because when you ask somebody when they want to retire, the first thing they think about is right away. Everyone wants to retire as soon as possible, which may or may not be true, we'll see here. Um, so if this is the case, and retiring as early as possible is the reference point, then according to query theory, people will first query their memory for argues, arguments in favor of early claiming. So the first thing they're thinking about is early claiming. They're asking themselves about the benefits of early claiming. Only then will they think about arguments in favor of delaying claiming. So it's this order that really is going to affect preferences, affect reference points, and therefore affect preferences. And we see this in a series of studies. So we were thinking, if we can change the frame, how we present the decision, might this change the reference point? And then according to query theory, like I just said, if you can change the reference point, you change the order of the question people are asking themselves, and this can change preferences. So I'm going to go over five studies, two of them are really quick, um, that really just explores this whole notion. Does query theory help explain the retirement decision? Um, and what can we find out just from using the query theory paradigm to help us explain and move forward? So the first study is an exploratory study of the claim decision. First asking, is the reference point really early claiming? Is this really what people think about first? What kind of thoughts are they having? Things like that. Um, in the second and third study, we use a mild framing and an extreme framing manipulation where we try to shift, the people's, shift people's focus um, in order to shift the reference point. And then in studies four and five, we really do uh, this more extreme query, it's not really extreme, but more true to query theories uh, predictions, and we ask them to frame the future first. So we're going to ask them to think about the decision in the opposite order than what they're actually predisposed to doing. So as I mentioned in the exploratory study, um, the first thing we expected to find was that many participants will prefer to claim early. So just replicating the retirement spikes that is seen so often in the surveys, and also in, in real life. Um, also, we expected early claiming to be a reference point for many participants. So this is the, the notion that the first thing people think about when they want to retire is, I want to retire as soon as possible. And then finally, the query theory aspect of it is, the prominence of thoughts in favor of early claiming will predict a preference for early claiming. So how many thoughts people have in favor of early claiming as well as how early they have those thoughts, because remember it's the order of the thoughts that matters, um, will predict a preference for early claiming. So this is just a screenshot of what people saw. Um, this is similar to the graph Jason is showing in the graph that's in front of you. It just shows basically um, how claiming affects what, how much money you receive, the age of claiming. And, and this stays on there for a lot of the experiments. So as they're answering questions, it's not like they had to memorize this. They can keep referencing back and forth to see um, the information. Then we ask them to tell us everything you're thinking about when potentially making the retirement decision. So we don't care if it's positive, negative, about early claiming, late claiming, just tell us everything that might go into your thought process when making the claiming decision. Then we ask them the key question, when do you think you'll retire, or some people have already retired, when, this is a hypothetical situation, but they're all uh, within retirement age, or nearing it. And then we, ask, we show them their thoughts again and ask them to code their own thoughts. So was this thought that you typed in, I need money now, does that favor collecting benefits early, late, the full retirement age, or none of the above? So moving on to the results of the exploratory study, what we found is indeed we replicated the retirement spikes that you see uh, in the real world and in survey research, which is uh, many, many, many people prefer to claim as early as possible. Then there's another retirement spike at the full retirement age, and then a spike at 70, which that could just be some wishful thinking going on, or maybe some people do that. Um, and we do see a difference between people who were already eligible versus not yet eligible for benefits. I'm not going to get too much into that. It's just the, the general finding over all the studies is that people who are already eligible for benefits, so people that are 62, let's say, um, are more impulsive than people who are making this decision prospectively. What factual ages of people answering this? It's 45 to 70. Can you go over that last point? The impulsive? Yeah. yeah, so um, we asked people whether they were already eligible for benefits versus not. So the age, so people that were under 62 were not yet eligible for retirement benefits um, without some exceptions of um, survivors. 
Um, and the people who are 62 and older right now can claim benefits if they want to. So what we found in a, you'll see in a couple of graphs, but it's not going to be the main thing I'm talking about today, but I can get more into it in the question and answer, is that people who are already eligible, so who are right now deciding take benefits or not, are more likely to say they want to take them early. Whereas people who are younger, let's say 50, and they're thinking about it prospectively, so they're making this decision about the future, are more patient about the decision. They're more likely to say that they're going to wait to claim benefits. Um, we also found that early claiming is a reference point for many participants. And this is going to be really important moving forward with the query theory predictions because remember, query theory uh, rests on the notion that people first ask themselves questions about the reference point. So if we find here that the reference point is early claiming, that suggests in the future studies you'll see that people really do start asking themselves first about um, their questions about early claiming and only then think about delayed claiming. And we also found that reference point is actually highly correlated with preferred claiming age. So the more you think about one of these ages, the more likely you are to want to claim at that age. Um, and then finally, this is the query theory prediction, prominence of thoughts in favor of early claiming. So how many thoughts and how early those thoughts were predicted preferred claiming age. So the more and more often and earlier you have thoughts about early claiming, the earlier you prefer to claim. So we found, we replicated the retirement spikes in 62 full retirement age. I should note, by the way, we had a different survey for people whose full retirement age was 66 versus 67. So um, I think these were just showing you the 66 ones. Um, also, importantly for query theory, many participants adopt early claiming as a reference point. And finally, prominence of early claiming thoughts predicts a preference for early claiming. So now that we know that uh, Many people use early claiming as a reference point, which was a really big finding, I think. Um, we wanted to know what happens if we change the display, we change the frame, how people are seeing this information. So the top graph is the graph that um, is the typical graph that people have seen over and over, you've seen a few times now. The second graph, what we're calling the shifted axis graph, is actually expected to get people to <coughs> focus on the full retirement age. So you can see the full retirement age in the middle and the money associated with that age. If you claim later, bars go up, money goes up. If you claim earlier, the bars are now below the axis. We thought maybe this would really hit home that earlier claiming gives you less money. Unfortunately, that's not what we found at all. Basically, there was no effect of the shifted axis graph. People were not adopting a later claiming as, as a reference point when we, saw, when we showed them the shifted axis graph. And I should note, none of the wording in that original um, screen that I showed you, none of the wording changed. So it was just the graph that changed. And this is expected from the fact that the reference point didn't change. People also do not prefer to claim later in the shifted axis graph. So we were kind of hoping that would work, but we weren't too surprised. So what we did next was really what they call in the field, try to hit them over the head with this. So we tried to make it a top to bottom. Um, you're losing money as you go down. Green bars, gaining money. Red bars, losing money. Positive numbers, negative numbers. We really thought this would really, you know, make them think about it. Fortunately, we found the same exact thing. These graphs are just <laughs> not working for people. Um, it really had little, almost no effect on the preferred language. So this is where we bring in the query theory process change intervention. So as we know, again, many people are using early claiming as a reference point. But what happens to claiming preferences if we actually change the way that people approach this decision? So in these experiments, we actually ask people to frame the future first. So like I said, um, what people are naturally doing when they're just telling us about this retirement decision, they're listing first early claiming thoughts and then listing thoughts about delaying claiming. So we're calling that the natural order because without any intervention, that's what people will naturally <coughs> do. Participants in the unnatural order or the frame the future first condition, um, we ask people to flip this order of thinking. So first think about claiming later and then think about claiming earlier. So this is just um, to show you how people were given the prompts. So this is the, the natural order, um, where they're first asked to give information about benefits received early and then later. And then in the unnatural or frame the future first condition, it's opposite. They're asked to give thoughts about later claiming and then early claiming. 
So what we expected to find was that participants in the unnatural order, so those framing the future first, will adopt later claiming as a reference point. Um, as a result, have later uh, have less prominent thoughts about early claiming, and then therefore prefer to claim later. And this is what we found. So participants in the unnatural order do adopt later claiming as a reference point. They also have less prominent thoughts about early claiming. So we're getting people to think more about the later claiming thoughts and less about early claiming. And this actually resulted, yes? Do you mean that they actually made the decision or in this study they said I would do it? This is a hypothetical decision. We'd love to trap people all the way to retirement, but um, so, uh, the most important finding is that participants in the unnatural order actually, in the hypothetical decision, prefer to claim approximately nine months later. So this is a big finding, similar, probably a little bit more than some of the Brown studies. Um, so one thing you might be thinking is, okay, this is really interesting, but can I really, as a financial advisor or as a policymaker, <coughs> Can I really implement this? Can I really get people to sit down on a computer, list thoughts, breathe their thoughts, you know, things like that. So we were looking for a more uh, policy relevant way to, that we could approach this decision. So we wondered, what if we just give people the reasons in a separate, in the, in the network? So give people reasons for claiming early and claiming late, and then flip those reasons for people in the unnatural order. So what we did here was we used reasons that people gave in the earlier studies. Um, for example, um, I don't want to have to work until I'm old. I want to enjoy some non-work time with friends and family. So this is a reason for early cleaning. Just skip through a lot of them. I don't like my job anymore, so cleaning benefits now would let me leave a bad situation. And then for the later cleaning thoughts, um, I want to work as long as I physically can. Only health problems would stop me from working. And what we find, so we gave people these in either the natural order or the unnatural order. And all they're asking, we're asking them to do is, do you think this thought will come into play when you're making the retirement decision? So now they're not producing the thoughts, they're just judging whether they're important thoughts. And what we find here is exactly the same thing we found with when they were listing the thoughts out themselves. We found that participants in the unnatural order preferred to claim later than participants who were get, getting these statements in the natural order. Um, and this is just a graph to show the effectiveness of the intervention. So Jason mentioned earlier this Brown, Captain, and Mitchell study. This is the break-even analysis that he mentioned with the break-even framing. That caused people to prefer to claim 15 months earlier. And then they had a few other studies with gains and losses. I forget what the other one was. Um, but that got people to claim about maybe four months later, um, which is on par with one of our graph studies and not the other one necessarily. But then what we found was that the query theory changing the way people think about the decision, asking them to frame the future first, was much more effective in getting people to prefer a later claiming age. So just in sum, the claiming decision, obviously, as you heard throughout the whole panel, is an extremely important decision, but it does seem to be constructive. It doesn't seem to be something that people think about for their entire lives and plan their horizon from the beginning they start working until the time they retire. Um, one piece of uh, study data shows that 44% uh, of people say they first think about retiring within a year of retiring. So 22% said six months before retiring, another 22% said a year before retiring. So this is probably not an economist's favorite finding here. People are not really thinking about the decision for too long. But this suggests that it can be changed. Um, so what we found in this study is that the reference point is early claiming, but if we can change the frame, we can change the reference point. And according to query theory, if we change the reference point, we change the query order, and then we can change preferences. Um, and then overall, these behavioral types of things, psychological types of research, I personally find to be very important. I'm a psychologist, so of course I do. But um, understanding these process, and these like the underlying process of why people may do these certain behaviors. So in this case, why people retire when they do, um, is very important for helping design interventions going forward. So far, we found that changing the displays or changing the graphs are not that useful at this point, but changing the order of consideration, asking people to frame the future first, has been successful. That's all. Thank you. Going through Melissa's presentation, I want to remind you talking about framing issues. You asked a great question of was that current behavior is a hypothetical. Um, these things do set up future research on how we do framing, but it's not just an academic exercise. We use this stuff in real life. And, and I want to give you sort of an example of the idea of query theory and how we change something. So 
if you go back three years, then three to 10 years ago, the Social Security Administration publications, they had this great little document uh, and graphic they would put all over the country that 62, 65, 70, 62, 65, 70, those are the retirement ages, early, full retirement age, and then the last thing claim benefits for. And that was going everywhere. And it sort of gave this, again, the, the query theory, the ordinance preferencing, sort of gave the tacit support that Social Security was endorsing age 62 as the first claim in age. Um, and so we changed that. We also noticed on the Social Security statement that you'd get in the mail that was estimating your benefits at retirement, that it started off with age 62, then your full retirement age, then 70. Mm -hmm. So we changed the ordering. And so it's not to bias for early claiming versus delayed. We now on the statement show the full retirement age, so 66 or 67 first. Then we show now age 70. So we show the full retirement age, show age 70 to be the gain, and then last we show 66 to show that cliff that would happen. We've now changed the order. Um, so this is how we're using this in sort of real life examples of how research is impacting how we do things. Um, that handout that we gave you guys, a two-pager, a lot went into this. Think about what goes into a Social Security claim office and a representative who talks to claimants who come in and all the training they get. There's all these publications online we hand out. There's 7, 12, 20 pages, all designed by the communications team. This one was designed by a lot of people in this room. Uh, it went to the Hill Committee, some Congress. It went to AARP. It went to the Federal Reserve. I mean, everyone who's been working with us on financial literacy, we got involved and said, Take all the information you think is important for someone to know when they go make a claim decision, but get it down to two pages, including a graphic. The advisory board, everyone helped with this. So instead of having too many chefs in the kitchen ruining the soup, this actually became one of the best soups out there. Um, this is how we're using the financial list information. We had the academics help us in these projects. Everyone was sort of involved in making this great project, and that's how we were using it. Um, so that's sort of how you know, the, the Curie theory and framing have gone into real line publications and changing existing products. Um, I also was thinking about um, Lisa's point about the financial advisors, how four out of 10 things a gamble to delay, which made me think we need to fire four out of 10 financial advisors. <laughs> then I thought of my own framing, is it better to say four out of 10 or two out of five? Which one sounds different? Um, but that, how you display numbers, is the whole idea behind framing and so it's out of curing theory. So I just wanted to bring that up. In the beginning, there was some discussion about well, rational actors and like, why do people do what they do, do they, is that because they don't understand Social Security? And one little saying I think sums a lot of this up, it's a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And that's what a lot of people grow up with. Uh, it's all fine to say you're gonna have it, but what matters, sometimes it's better to take what you've got uh, and particularly people with low income levels. And that is not because of lack of, I mean, maybe because of lack of information, but I think often it's not. Because if when you're poor and you have a list of 52 things you have to pay for, and you look at your income, and there is no way in hell you're gonna pay for them all, you just start paying what you have to pay. And you hope that the other ones won't come up. So you know you're living today. You don't know if you're gonna to live till you're 70. Um, when you have more discretionary income, you can make other decisions. I don't think that's irrational. It's the only way you can do it sometimes. So I, the, the point here about a rational actor, and, and so rational does not mean someone's acting irrational. It just means that in some way how you frame the decision now changes their choice. So I'm just saying that a person who doesn't have resources sure, sure. can't often oh, no, exactly. make those choices. And, and, and the point about the research is going in, if someone says, comes in and says, I need the money today for whatever reason. Um, I don't trust that Social Security is going to be around tomorrow, I need to pay bills today, et cetera. That's their reasoning. Then all the framing things we do shouldn't change that decision. That means they've made up their mind. They come in, they have a reason for it. If the framing changes it, then that means that the process going into it wasn't completely what economists call rational. So, what, I, what we're trying to do is make sure that in the information that's presented to people, that we don't sway them one way or the other, that we make sure you understand what information is important and make that personal choice. So it's right for me, remember right for you, right for Lisa, right for Claudia, it's all different. And that handout is all based on the personal choice. Think about survivor benefits, think about your spouse. Do you have other assets? Are you sick? Are you gonna live till be 75? 
These are the important considerations you think about that wasn't getting across in the central break even analysis. So that's how we sort of talk about the idea of rational actors, meaning that they're irrational, not thinking straight, just that the framing can change the decision process and why the framing is so important that we need to be aware of it when we're government employees. Can I just make one more comment about that? I think any, exactly what Jason was saying, any sort of behavioral intervention or anything that's trying to get people to change their behavior, the first aspect of it is we're not trying, well, we don't think that we're even going to be able to influence behavior of people who have poor health situations, have lost their job, have been forced out of work, things of that nature. It's more people for whom retirement is a choice. And those are the people that, if they're claiming early for no other reason besides, I don't feel like working anymore, maybe that might be the decision they want to make, but it might be helpful to get people to think, well, maybe if you did work a little longer, it wouldn't be as bad as you thought. Maybe um, you would really want this money. So we're trying to help. We're not trying to help. Jason's <laughs> trying to help. Well, we are trying to help people make the best decision that's right for them. If the decision that's right for them is, I need my money now, that's fine. If the decision is more based on something that has to do with impulsivity or a feeling or an emotion or something of that nature, then I think that there's more room for uh, some of these interventions to so, so I'm going to take chair privilege and give your next question, because it, it does follow on to this. So. So I, we talked a lot about framing today, and I want I want you guys to to explain how that how you should think about that in relationship to education, because I think you know Social Security and I you know is trying to be neutral and not tell people what's the right thing to do, but I think you know a lot of the research you know we saw today and out of behavioral economics, I mean, there are ways to, by framing things that kind of nudge people towards a decision, and I mean somebody who designs the frame has to be making a stand on what's right thing to be nudging people towards. So I guess I'd just be curious, like how you feel about that balance between the framing and the education, like what can't we educate people on, what can we, you know, how that fits together. Sure, I have two parts to that. So one part is the financial literacy versus the behavioral economics aspect of it. So in the field of behavioral economics, judgment and decision making, behavioral economics, did you say that, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, a lot of it rests on the notion that even if people had complete information, perfect ability to make every perfect decision they had, they would still make these irrational, irrational decisions. So there's still things that come into play, like framing, that have nothing to do with how well educated people are, whether they know the information or not. So that's one important aspect of it. Um, the second part of your question sorry, was, what is just the, the idea of like getting better frames versus educating people oh, more I think about the I think the other thing I was going to say was somebody has to make the right decision of what is the So I, one of the notions also of behavioral economics is that there is no neutral decision. There is no neutral point for a lot of decisions. So one of the examples I like to give is when you're building a building, an office building, let's say, the bathrooms have to go somewhere. Where you put them could be inconsequential, but if you put them at the top of the stairwell versus at the bottom of the stairwell, maybe people will walk up the stairs more. It's not saying, hmm, people can't take the elevator. It's not saying people can't be on the right floor. It's just saying, if we're trying to structure choice, it's called choice architecture. If we're trying to structure um, these decisions one way or another, there has to be some sort of decision one way or another. Let's make the decision that could potentially nudge people toward a better decision that's right for them. But they can always choose another decision. They could always do something else, so. Was it Claudia's question, what's the right decision? How do we know what the right decision is? We don't know what the right decision is, and that's what Jason was saying earlier about every every decision is an individual decision, a personal decision, and like I said, Social Security is neutral with regard to that. But there has been some research that um, I think Alicia Vanell talks a lot about this that maybe working longer would help people have more retirement security, but that doesn't mean they have to work longer. Do you think? Um, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, do you think uh, using uh, instead of this hypothetical number that you you give in? Maybe do you think that the frame would be more effective? I'm not sure 
sure that it would be more effective. That would be interesting to do. I think it would be difficult to do, just because we would need the access to all their medical records and things like no, that. No, not have you, them come but in. you have okay. them go onto the right. website. That, that, that would be something that maybe Social Security would do in the future. I am not saying they would, but it's an interesting idea. No, but in your site, yeah. can you have the address into that website? Oh. They can check it and then uh, continue with Yeah, the they could probably do that. Dr. Lowry Lowenstein, I found this very interesting, particularly the use of research for such a significant area of financial literacy and financial dignity. Um, I'm fascinated with the research, but I'm, I'm, I'm questioning in my mind, and it may, I don't know if this is going to make sense because my mind is racing, and it, it relates to the question you, you asked. In communities that are different than the ones represented by people on the stage, um, that are not as educated, that have different ethnic, cultural um, backgrounds, they're not making decisions based on the same living in cultures. We're just like Native Americans, you know. And how does how does the how do, do the policy makers and how do researchers address the issues of cultural diversity? Can I try that first? So first of all, God bless you for the question. Um, I'm going to answer your question along with John Sebas about the right decision. So the first thing is, what's right is a personal decision. You hope that when looking in hindsight, people could go back and say, I had all the proper information I needed at that time to make a decision to turn out to be right. It's not me telling you it's right or somebody else, it's making sure you have the information. This then goes to your question about, because we're all different, uh, different educational levels, different income levels, how do you actually make sure the information you're presenting is useful? And the frame, and, and the, the frame, frame is, is resonant. So uh, Michael Collins, who is Wisconsin, his specialty research center, which was being supported by SSA and part of the collaboration that was done with Dartmouth, Rand, GW, was doing work, his sole focus was looking at underserved populations and minorities. He's doing work out What's there. What's his name? Michael Collins. So it's J. Michael Collins. Oh, he's an anthropologist. He's an anthropologist. He did an underserved Yeah, because he's, he's doing a lot of work on the underserved and how, how to help them be more financially literate, literate. What does that mean? How do you present information? He's doing all this work. And that's why, in some ways, this information is so important to do as research. And gets back into what does that mean for governments? A lot of government agencies are very insular. They do their products. Yeah, they do their products in house and don't want to share. So one of the things that when I was at SSA was trying to share it and say, you know, we've got nine nine tenths of it right. We think, can you help us see where we're making mistakes where we might be coming short on some things? And it's amazing the little things you see, where someone just says, why are you putting 62 first? Well, it's been there for 20 years. Wait a minute, why didn't I question that? You just you get used to your own culture. You don't right, think about exactly. it. And the same thing happens to minorities. We were getting good questions. Um, even from historically black college universities who looking at some of the research saying, can you change some of this language to make it more what they thought was neutral? We haven't thought about it. So we can change it. And, and that's where the importance of often the testing. So when you start putting out uh, publications, educational materials, whether it's for mortgages, car loans, payday lenders, we should be doing testing to see how people see it in the frame, giving them multiple frames to see what happens. Um, I'm no longer in the government, so I can say it. I would love to actually have the retirement or the online application of Social Security have people, when they go online to file for benefits, go through the entire process. And when it says, verify this information, is this right? Yes. Hey, we've realized that you're age 63. Do you realize if you file later, you get this much more money? Do you want it to file today anyway? Or do you want more information? And see if they go, wait, what? I, this is new framework. I would love to do that. That can be a great experiment. Of course, you can't get it through Congress. But that's sort of where you want to see people making a decision when you show them the dollar values or anything else. But we have to test this kind of stuff. There's also something interesting. because We say that it's personal. But some people grow up in a more clan or a family. And so, they're, so I'm wondering, in our designing our research or designing our materials, are we? Are there ways to address some cultural beliefs and behaviors that are different? And so that's. I mean, I don't think that's an easy answer. It, I just you've stimulated my thinking, and I thank you. And and I have one other thought, and that is that 
there, there are tremendous implications of your research that are not just for the adults. Uh, we really need to, we need to frame some of these issues for a public schooling. And, and we, if we, because what I think your, your research suggests is the importance of culture change. And it just doesn't happen for the adults. We've got to look into the community. And, and, and Ted Beckett Neefe, the National uh, Endowment for Financial Education, uh, is doing a lot of work on the K through 12 and supporting that kind of research. And what's his name? Ted Beck, the National Endowment for Financial Education. Neefe. And there, he's on the President's Council for Financial. So we should probably go back to your Federal Reserve colleague because they're having to pay the bill. So I, I uh, thank you for pointing out the, the question because I think the difference between something you, you quoted some work by Jeff Brown on annuitization and then the work on claiming. So I, it turns out I was just asking uh, a question. I actually do think most people it does make sense to get them to retire a little bit later. Changing their frame of reference to get them to do that seems to make a lot of sense. Okay. On annuitization, I think it's a, it, it could be a very different question and what we're learning is that we can get people to say that they should do things by changing their frame of reference but it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Jason, you're on the eve of retirement. Anybody who talks to me about annuitization, I give them this question. You're on the eve of retirement. You're going to get a benefit which is 50% of your pre-retirement salary. You have in a 401k account four times your annual salary. You own your house and your kids have moved out. How much of that retirement benefit in the plan, that four times your salary, should you annuitize? Should or would I? Good question. So this is you're right, this is where you, the question of how do you calculate what someone's benefit is. So I actually had a long talk with two financial planners, including one who was trying to help my mother, uh, which was then very personal to me. Right. So going through, and I said, did you do a sensitivity analysis for her to say, here's what you have in wealth, here's what you can buy at various levels of your wealth. So if you have, you want to take 100 percent, here's what you get. If you want to do 50, you get this, uh, and then show what your money's buying for assurance and risk, right? What, do you, what risk are you buying down? And the trade-off. And I think what people, and again, this is what the framing is, annuities in some ways is a package have evolved. People say, well, I'm afraid that, I don't, I don't know that person, that company's gonna be around in 30 years because it's still getting money. I wanna leave a request for my heirs. All these things spend the cost of the fees and the transactions. So the, um, the companies that provide annuities have done a lot of new products to try to address those concerns. And there's still the issue that I'm framing where someone says, wait a minute, you made this point up. You said, Jason, how much are you willing to annuitize? Right? How am I looking at it? Am I looking at it as an investment? Maybe I can do better putting it in a mutual fund. Where you're saying, Jason, how much income do you want to make sure you have per month that's guaranteed for the rest of your life? Well, I asked you the question. You know how to frame it. <laughs> answer the question. Well, so, so my thing is, I look at, I, so I actually run financial numbers on my own retirement. So every year at my birthday, I have a spreadsheet. And I put in what I had last year for my 401k, my personal savings. Uh, the retirement and then Social Security, but I think the benefit's going to be. And I run it and see, based on this year's new information, rate of return and investment, am I close to retiring? Or can I like, maybe take a half-time job, I go to the beach, maybe be a full-time academic and do this full-time and not worry about my income? And it's nice to see the savings go up and that date come closer. And the question is, well, how do you want to gear up to that annuity? And my thing has been 50%. I'm trying to get to a target where I can, the point where I can annuitize 50% of that wealth to guarantee income with Social Security and the rest that I could have for capital accumulation. But that's so you're, you're targeting to, to annuitize 50% of your own? Yep. Okay. But so I, I, my other point is that big value. We, can, we might be able to steer people, nudge people to do a certain thing, but it may not be the right thing for everyone. And, and your point, too, is also now change the question to go with income people. So, right, so for people who are lower income, Social Security is the best inflation for annuity money can buy, period, hands down. For someone with low income who has very maybe modest savings, if any, it does not make any sense for them to buy additional annuity. They've already got it so secure. And I think that then is the wrong decision, but that's part of the conversation. So it really goes into, again, a personal decision based on your risk, your income, and other assets. What are you trying to buy? And I think that's the important question. All right. Well, these have, these have been fabulous questions, but we are at five. Trouble with you all, and that one managed, I think, to hit almost every theme that we talked about this afternoon. So, so I want, to, if you all will join me in thanking our panelists again for a very. <laughs> Anna Maria also wanted me to point out that if your interest is further piqued in this topic, that there are several. 
uh, insight kind of summary research handouts that are on a table right as you go to the left. And these are done by the, uh, the Financial Literacy Center. So a lot of topics related to Social Security. So again, thank you all for coming.